Hello, welcome to our CompTIA Security Plus course. In this lesson, we're going to talk about wireless security settings covering the following. Access methods, wireless cryptographic protocols, authentication protocols, and wireless access installation. So as wireless technology has become nearly ubiquitous, right, the focus on wireless security has increased. Many improvements have been made over the years, in particular in terms of preventing unauthorized access is provided to authorized clients, while ensuring that those are not authorized are not allowed. Authentication to wireless networks is typically accomplished through one of the following methods. First is authentication, shared authentication, and extensible authentication protocol, right, or EAP authentication. Although it's not as common as, as it was once, right, the simplest option for many wireless networks is to forego authentication and use an open network. An open network does not provide encryption. It does not even require a password to connect. In fact, an open network does not attempt to provide any security at all. Users simply select the network name or the service set identifier or SSID for the network open configuration right? for the network. Open configuration is simply not recommended. Some open networks first require the user to connect through a captive portal, which is a web page that is launched first when connecting through a network. It usually requires some type of interaction before the user is allowed access to other networking or, or internet sites. Open networks might use captive portals for advertising or to provide terms of use for the connecting user. Such portals are common in public places such as airports and coffee shops. The user simply clicks accept, views an advertisement, provides an email address, or performs some other required action. The network then grants access to the user and no longer holds the user captive to the portal. Now, the next one is about uh, shared um, authentication, right, which uses a pre-shared key. Essentially, the key on the wireless access device is the same key that each user can use to connect to the network. And the third one is uh, the EAP protocol or the extensible authentication protocol. EAP is commonly used in larger organization. The authentication process is a bit more involved because an authentication server is required. EAP is an extension of point-to-point -point protocol and allows for flexibility in, in authentication, including authentication methods beyond just a username and password. Instead of using PPP, however, the IEEE 802.1x standard defines using EAP over both wired Ethernet and wireless networks. EAP is a challenge response protocol that can be run over secure transport mechanisms. It is a flexible authentication technology and can be used with smart cards, one-time passwords, and public key encryption. EAP also provides support for public certificates that are deployed using auto-enrollment or smart cards. These security improvements enable access control to Ethernet networks in public places such as malls and airports. Let's talk about wireless cryptographic protocols. To properly manage the risk of wireless networks and prevent unauthorized access, you must understand the wireless cryptographic protocols available. Organizations of all sizes, even home users, need to be aware of the available technologies. The industry has done a lot of help to make technology simple and easy to use, but it has also introduced vulnerable technologies to make the setup and configuration of wireless clients mindlessly simple. Consider, for example, um, WPS or the Wi-Fi protected setup, originally known as Wi-Fi um, simple config. WPS is an extension of the wireless standards whose purpose was to simplify for end users the process of establishing secure wireless home networks. As Wi-Fi devices entered the mainstream, setup was initially complex, consequently, Users often run with default configuration, leaving their wireless networks wide open and easy to exploit. So here, w WPS was introduced as a better option. WPS provides two certified modes of operation. The first requires the user to enter a PIN code when connecting devices. The second method requires the user to simply push a button on the AP and connect to the wireless device. In 2011, 
However, a major security vulnerability was exposed. In fact, the vulnerability was so severe that the solution was to turn off WPS um, altogether. And it turned out that the user's pin could be recovered through brute force, brute force attack in as few as 1,100 guesses or 11,000 guesses or within several hours. In some cases, disabling WPS was not even enough to prevent such attacks, and a firmware upgrade was required to completely disable the feature. Wi-Fi protective setup right, should not be used. At a minimum, it should, it should at least be disabled. Since WPS was determined to be insecure, several protocols has been developed to protect wireless networks the primary goals of this cryptographic protocols are to protect the authentication and connection process and also to ensure the confidentiality of data sent through the air there's actually four common protocols that have worked to achieve these goals the web right wpa wpa2 and wpa3 web right or wep wired equivalence uh, privacy this original wireless encryption standard should not be used today, but it is still occasionally is. Its goal was to provide security on par with that of wired networks, but WEP has many known security issues. It was superseded in 2003 by WPA. Next one is the WPA or Wi-Fi Protected Access. WPA was um, developed in response to security concerns over WEP. WPA is implemented using a couple of different options for encryption. And the third one is WPA2. WPA2 further improved on WPA. Since 2006, it has been required for the Wi-Fi certified devices. WPA2 introduced the use of AES, right? Or Advanced Encryption Standard for Encryption. And the third one is WPA3. WPA3 added more features and strengths to the widely adopted WPA2 protocol. Specifically, WPA3 maintains um, strong cryptographic algorithms while improving the key exchange. Let's talk about authentication protocols. There's actually four protocols being used with EAP and provide authentication for wireless networks. Those are EAP TLS, PEEP, EAP TTLS and EAP FAST. So what are these? Let's talk about the first one, which is EAP TLS. EAP TLS uses certificate-based mutual authentication, negotiation of the encryption method, and encrypted key determination between the client and the authenticating server. EAP messages are encapsulated into 802.1x packets and are marked as EAP over LAN or EAP all after the client sends a connection request or wireless access point. The authenticator marks all initial communication with the client as unauthorized. Only EAP poll messages are accepted, while in this mode, all other types of communication are blocked until credentials are verified with an authentication server. Upon receiving an EAP poll request from, the from a client, the wireless access point requests login uh, credentials and passes them to an authentication server. Radius is usually employed for authentication purposes. However, 802.1x does not make it mandatory. Radius Federation allows a user's valid authentication to be shared across trusted entities. This trust must be established beforehand and the Radius server makes assertion about the user identity and other attributes. This enables users to seamlessly roam across different wireless networks without having to re-authenticate with unique credentials for another entity. Note that Radius Federation allow a user valid authentication to be shared across trusted entities. Now let's talk about the next one, which is PEEP or Protected EAP. PEEP provides several additional benefits over EAP TLS, including an encrypted authentication channel, dynamic keying material from TLS, a fast reconnect capability using cached session keys, and server authentication that guards against unauthorized access points. PEEP offers a means of protecting another EAP method within a TLS tunnel. PEEP is thus basically a secure wrapper around EAP. It is essentially in preventing attacks on password-based EAP methods. As part of the PEEP negotiation, the client establishes a TLS session with a radio server. Let's talk about the third about the third one, which is EAP TTLS. EAP TTLS is similar to PEEP but further builds on TLS. 
with an established secure uh, tunnel, the server authenticates the client using authentication attributes within the TLS wrapper. And the fourth one is EAP uh, FAST, or the EAP Flexible Authentication via Secure Tunneling. EAP FAST is a proposed uh, replacement to the Lightweight Extensible Authentication Protocol, or LEAP, which for years has been known to contain uh, vulnerabilities. The goal of EAP FAST is to provide a replacement that is also lightweight but secure. EAP FAST also works like PEEP but does not require client or server certificates. Instead, it uses a protected access credential or PAC. Okay, let me put it here. Which is essentially a shared secret between the client and the authentication server to establish a tunnel in which authentication is then performed. For many organizations that don't manage, don't want to manage certificates, EAP FAST might be an ideal alternative to LEAP. Now, each protocol is developed and backed by specific vendors, right? An organization's choice of vendors might dictate the choice of solution. Organizations also need to consider their appetite for managing a certificate infrastructure and deploying certificates. Not having to worry about certificates greatly reduces the burden for many. EAP TLS requires client and server certificates for mutual authentication. Both PEEP, right? PEEP and EAP TLS eliminate the requirement to deploy client certificate. However, EAP FAST does not require any certificate. Let's talk about wireless access installation. So no network is complete, right, without the wireless access points. Most businesses provide wireless access for both employees, guests, and guests, right? With this expected convenience, some security implications that must be addressed to keep the network safe from vulnerabilities and attacks. So this lesson covers basic access point types, configuration, and preventive measures an organization can implement to mitigate risk and reduce its attack surface. Wireless LAN Air Network Controllers, or WLAN Controllers, or WLCs, are physical devices that communicate with each access point uh, simultaneously. A centralized access controller is capable of providing management, configuration, encryption, and policy settings for wireless LAN access points. A controller-based WLAN design acts as a switch for wireless traffic and provides 10 APs with configuration settings. Some ACs, or access controllers, perform firewall, VPN, IDS, IPS, and monitoring functions. The level of control and management options an AC needs to provide depend on the type of access points uh, the, organiza the organization implements. <laughs> there are three main types of wireless access points that exist, FAT, FIT, and TIN. So FAT wireless access points are also sometimes called intelligent access points because they're all uh, inclusive. They contain everything needed to manage wireless clients such as ACLs, QoS functions, VLAN support, and band steering. FAT APs can be used as standalone access points and do not need an AC. However, this capability makes them expensive because they are built on powerful hardware and require complex software. Next are FIT access points. A FIT AP is a scaled down version of a FAT AP and uses an access controller for control and management function. The third one is a TIN access point. A TIN access point is nothing more than a radio and antenna controlled by a wireless switch. TIN access points are sometimes called intelligent antennas. In some instances, APs or access points do not perform wireless LAN encryption. They merely transmit or receive their encrypted wireless frames. A TIN AP has minimal functionality and a controller is required. TIN APs are simple and do not require complex hardware or software. A FAT access point is also known as an intelligent or standalone access point, right? And a TIN access point is also known as an intelligent antenna and is managed by a wireless LAN controller. So, when designing wireless networks, it is important to configure antenna uh, types, placement, and power output for maximum coverage and minimum interference. There are four basic and type of antennas that are commonly used in 802.11 wireless networking, right? Which includes parabolic grid, Yagi, dipole, and the vertical antenna. Wireless antennas are either omnidirectional and directional. An omnidirectional antenna provides a 360 degree radial pattern to provide the widest possible signal coverage. An example of an omnidirectional antenna is the type of antenna commonly found on an AP. 
directional antennas, right, like this one, concentrate the wireless signal in a specific direction, limiting the coverage area. An example of a directional antenna is a Yagi antenna, like this one. The need or use determines the type of antenna required. When an organization wants to connect one building to another building, for example, a directional antenna is used. If an organization is adding Wi-Fi internally to an office, a building, or a warehouse, an omnidirectional antenna is used. If an organization wants to in install a Wi-Fi in an outdoor campus environment, a combination of the two antennas is used. Site surveys and heat maps provide the following benefits, so just additional information. It identifies dead zones where there is no wireless coverage. It identifies trouble areas to help eliminate slows and slow speeds and poor performance, automate wireless network evaluation, and help adequately build out an efficient network. Physical placement and transmit power adjustment can make it harder for intruders to stay connected to our APs, but never count on physical placement alone to stop attackers. One of the physical requirements for wireless communication is that the transmitted wave must reach the receiver with an ample power to allow the receiver to distinguish the wave from the background noise. An antenna that is too strong raises security concerns. Strong omnidirectional Wi-Fi signals are radiated to a greater distance into neighboring areas where the signals can be readily detected and viewed. Minimizing transmission power reduces the chances of data leaks. Companies such as Cisco and Nortel have implemented dynamic power controls in their products. The system dynamically adjusts the power output of individual access points to accommodate changing network conditions, helping ensure predictable wireless performance and availability. Some additional concepts. So let's talk about MAC filtering. MAC filtering, right? So most um, wireless network routers and access points can filter devices based on their MAC addresses. A MAC Address is a unique identifier for network adapters. MAC filtering is actually a security access control method in which the MAC address is used to determine access to the network. When MAC address filtering is used, only the devices with the MAC addresses configured in the wireless router or access point are allowed to connect. MAC filtering permits and denies network access through the use of blacklist and whitelists. A blacklist is a list of MAC addresses that are denied However, a whitelist is a list of MAC addresses that are allowed access. Right? So MAC addresses gives a wireless network some additional protection, but they can be spoofed. An attacker can potentially capture details about a MAC address from the network and pretend to be the device in order to connect to the network. MAC filtering can be circumvented by scanning valid MAC, uh, valid MAC using a tool such as AeroDump NG or Aircrack NG Suite and then spoofing one's own MAC address into a validated MAC address. When an attacker knows a MAC address that is not in the blacklist or is in the whitelist, MAC filtering is almost useless. Now, another best practice is disabling SSID broadcast. So, note that an SSID or service set identifier is used to identify a wireless access point on the network. The SSID is transmitted so that wireless stations searching for a network connection can find it. By default, SSID broadcast is enabled. When you disable this feature, the SSID configured in the clients must match the SSID of the AP. Otherwise, the client cannot connect to the AP. Having SSID broadcast enabled essentially makes your AP visible to any device searching for a wireless connection. Now, to improve security of your network, change the SSIDs on your APs. Using the default SSID poses a security risk even if the AP is not broadcasting it. When changing default SSIDs, do not change them to reflect your company name, main names, divisions, products, or address. Using such guessable SSIDs would make you an easy target for attacks such as war driving, war flying, and war chalking. With war driving, a person in a moving vehicle searches for wireless networks using a portable computer or another mobile device. War flying is similar but involves the use of aircraft or drone technology. War uh, wire chalking involves drawing symbols in public places to advertise open Wi-Fi networks. Keep in mind that if an SID name is enticing enough, it might attract hackers. All right, in this lesson, um, we spoke about different wireless security settings such as access methods, wireless cryptographic protocols, authentication protocols, and wireless access installation. Thank you very much.